Our scripture reading for today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 33 through 37, and can be found in your bulletin. I invite you to listen for God to speak to you through these words. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make out hair, you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this is one of those Sundays that I will probably always remember. This is kind of like the Christmas for a pastor. We have both sacraments happening in one service with sweet Madeline, who's not in her car seat anymore. <laughs> Sam, come on, man, where'd you go? No, we have a sweet baptism today. We got communion later on and then a sermon here in the middle. So if this thing fails, at least we did those other really fun things uh, before that. Uh, you and I live today, uh, day in and day out, in what has come to be known as the relational paradox. Have you heard of this before? The relational paradox. Uh, to kind of sum up what that is, the relational paradox is where all of us, choir, those at the lake, here in the pews, every last one of us want to know others and be known by others. And yet, we fear ever really being known. Do you know what I mean? We want to know and be known, but we're afraid of people actually knowing the real us. So what do we do? Well, we hide. You might not think you're big on hiding, but we all do it. We put forward a false presentation of who we are. We hide behind our false selves and never allow anyone to know our true selves. You know, we bend and we distort reality so that we can then control how other people perceive us. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? Unfortunately, all this does is it ends up placing us back where we never wanted to be, and that is feeling alone and isolated. Because of our hiding, we keep things surface level, and we don't allow anyone underneath the surface, and we worry the whole time about someone eventually cracking through the walls that we put up and knowing the real us, and it leads us in a life of fear, but really it just kind of becomes this endless cycle of unfulfilling relationships. We want to know you, we want to be known by others, but we're afraid that if you knew the real us, well, you might not like us anymore. You might not want to be around me or in relationship with me anymore. Now this is all kind of sad and depressing, so let's just go quickly into the good news of all this. And that is that this is not how it's supposed to be. In fact, it was never meant to be this way, and it doesn't have to be this way either. I want us to remember that we are walking through Jesus's teachings that we call the Sermon on the Mount, right here in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And I had the opportunity to preach the first week uh, of this sermon series down in Modern, and I said it to that crowd, and I'll say it to you as well, that this might be, in my opinion anyway, this might be the most important thing that we could ever do as a church together. 
And that is walking through these teachings of Jesus, reading and attempting to understand and listening to these teachings of Jesus, letting them get deep within us and trying to live these things out as well, that we would hear Jesus's words and then practice them in our daily life. I would argue this might be the most important thing we could ever do as a church. And that is why I told them that I don't want you to miss a single week. So if you are new or newer, welcome. I hope you like it today and I hope you come back. (laughs) And if you do, then I hope you listen to our podcast or or check out our YouTube page where you can hear these sermons. And by the way, I'm not saying that because I think we have like excellent preachers here, though I do think we got some good ones. So don't let Mike Holly say I said he was a bad preacher. Don't tell him I said that. Um, But we are walking through the most important things that we could walk through together. So don't miss a week, okay? Can I get a head nod? Maybe like a conference... Yeah, some of you are like, sure, and others are like, I'm not committing to this. But the whole point is that we are seeking, as Asbury United Methodist Church, to discover what it means to be a people who embody the way of Jesus together. And if you want to do that, we don't have to look any further than these words of Jesus. Uh, These are Jesus' teachings about his good news. We call it the gospel. His gospel was that the kingdom of heaven is here. It is available and accessible for you to live in and from today. How do you do that? Here's the Sermon on the Mount. It is Jesus' manifesto on how to be truly human, how to live as, as a citizen of the kingdom of God today. Which leads me to a question. What does such a person look like? That is, what does an individual living in and from the kingdom of God right now look like? Well, in order to answer that question, I want us to look once more at the text. So you can pull out your bulletin or a Bible and start with Matthew 5, verse 33 that Margaret read for us just a second ago. We jump back in and Jesus is saying again, that is once more, like I said to you last time, I'm going to continue teaching. Okay. So we jump right into the middle of this teaching and he says, again, you have heard that it was said. Uh, When Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, he is doing what uh, rabbis and teachers of his day would often do. And that is they are signaling that, Hey, I'm about to quote the Hebrew scriptures. So when you hear, you have heard that it was said, know that the next line out of this person's mouth has something to do with the Hebrew scriptures, okay? So last week, for example, we read the text, you shall uh, not kill. Uh, You have heard that it was said, do not kill, right? Obviously, Jesus is quoting one of the Ten Commandments right out of Exodus. He's quoting the scriptures. Okay, so Jesus is here. He's saying, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times. I'm about to quote the Hebrew scriptures. And then he says this, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows that you have made to the Lord. Now, what Jesus is doing here is he's actually quoting a bunch of scriptures. Like, for example, from Leviticus 19, he's quoting from Numbers 30, I think, uh, Deuteronomy. Essentially, he's quoting a bunch of scriptures that say the same thing in the Torah, which is the law or the first five books of our Bible. So again, you have heard that it was said of those in ancient times, uh, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows that you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, now let me interrupt myself one more time. I'll try not to do it again. But when Jesus says, but I say to you, he is saying that I'm about to give you a truer interpretation than any other teaching that you have heard previously to now. I know what the other rabbis have said, what the Pharisees and the Sadducees have said. I know what other teachers of the law have said, but what I'm about to tell you, I need you to not miss. Pay attention. Okay, are we tracking? So I'm just going to go all the way back now and start over because I've interrupted myself three times. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows uh, that you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is God's footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, because, I mean, you can't even make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Now, what is Jesus talking about? Well, he's talking about oath-keeping, oath-making and oath-keeping covenant keeping, promises, vows. What we need to understand is that the ancient Near East was one of oral tradition. That's how their world worked, oral tradition. Uh, There were some who could read and write, 
but not everybody could read and write. So your day-to-day interactions where you were, let's just give an example. Say you wanted to trade your donkey for your neighbor's three chickens. I don't know why you want to trade a donkey for three chickens, but that's what we're going to do in this example. So say you wanted to do that. Well, more than likely, you weren't going to write up a legal agreement and put some initial here's in there and signatures here. No, you would probably give a handshake and make an oath that I will follow through on this promise. I will give you my donkey for your three chickens. Do we understand? This is a verbal agreement. And the community that Jesus was a part of, their flourishing depended greatly on the trustworthiness of one's word. Your word, and if you could keep it or not, was essential. So we see Jesus referencing laws here, put in place via the Torah and the scriptures, essentially that say, if you make a vow, fulfill it. Seems easy enough. But see, during Jesus's time, an oath was not seen as valid unless you brought God's name into it, unless you swore to God. Now, today we tell our kids, don't swear to God, right? But in their day and age, an oath in Jewish tradition was not seen as binding unless you brought God's name into it. The problem was, is that people during Jesus's time could not keep uh, their part of the oath. They could not keep up their end of the bargain. So they would say, yes, I'm going to give you my donkey for your three chickens. And then they wouldn't do it. Or they would lie. Or they would swear to God. And this was seen as an abuse of God's name. Hence the uh, commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It's not saying that three word phrase of oh my G-O-D. Though, you know, maybe you don't say that out loud in kindergarten, friends. But it's more than that. It's you made an oath. You brought God's name into this. And now you're not keeping it. You are abusing the name of God. So what people started doing is what Jesus talks about. They started swearing uh, by the heavens. They started swearing by the earth. They started swearing by the great city of Jerusalem. And this is what Jesus starts calling out here. He says, look, heaven is God's throne. The earth is God's footstool. The city of Jerusalem is the city of the great king. You can't separate these things from God. And in doing so, in swearing by such things, you are still abusing God's name. And then the people are like, okay, if we can't do that, we'll swear by our own heads. That is, we'll swear by our own lives. And he's like, yeah, but you're human. (laughs) You're not God. And you can't even make a single hair on your head white or black. And the reality is God is in all life. So every statement is made before him already. So what Jesus does here is he wraps this all up uh, by saying an answer, actually by giving an answer to the question I asked you a moment ago. You might remember it. I asked you, what does such a person living in and from the kingdom of God look like? Well, here's Jesus' answer. Such a person is someone whose yes means yes and whose no means no. Everything else is evil, Jesus says. A man who I learned a great deal from in watching old YouTube videos and reading his books, his name was Dallas Willard. And he wrote this excellent book, one of my favorite books of all time, called The Divine Conspiracy. Uh, Buy the book if you haven't yet. Read it and let's talk about it. You would make my day. And in The Divine Conspiracy, Dallas spends about 200 plus pages walking his readers through the Sermon on the Mount. And when he gets to this portion on Jesus' teaching concerning oaths, this is what he says. I think we have the quote on the screen. And I'm just going to level with you. Uh, If you hate the rest of the sermon, or if you don't like it so far, just, just go home with this quote, because it's everything, <laughs> all right? So this is what Willard writes. He says, the essence of swearing that Jesus targets here is about invoking something or someone else, especially God, to make your words seem more significant and weighty. So we're not talking about that four-letter word that you say when you stub your toe or step on that kid's Lego or something like that. We're not talking about curse words at all. Willard says when we're talking about the swearing here, the type of swearing that Jesus is targeting is when we invoke something or someone else, especially God, to make our words seem more significant and weighty. And here's where it gets real. He says the aim is to impress others with your seriousness or piety so that you get what you want. It's a device of manipulation designed to override the judgment or input of others in order to possess them for our purposes. 
Are you hearing the seriousness of what Jesus is talking about now? It's manipulation, or as we say in our culture today, spin. And Jesus calls this evil. Instead of loving and honoring others with truthfulness, the intent is to get to one's way by verbal manipulation of the thoughts and choices of others. This is a big deal. See, the root issue here is that we are presenting ourselves to one another through false presentations, through our fake selves, through our false selves. And in doing so, we are hiding who we are. We're not being honest with ourselves and we're not being honest with others. We are not living truthful lives with one another. We are using uh, something or someone else as this verbal smoke screen, if you will, to present ourselves in the best possible light. Another way of saying that is we're putting forth our highlight reels while concealing the behind the scenes. Um, you know a great place to see this happening, right, is on social media. If you're on social media, you've probably taken part of this. I know I have. Where we post the best picture. And it's summer, so I'm going to pick on the beach pictures. Where your whole family's in white shirts and khakis. You're sun-kissed. You look beautiful. Your teeth are shining white. The sun sets behind you. You're all smiling. And that's the picture you make your cover photo on Facebook, right? Like, that's the new profile picture. That's what you send out on Instagram or Snapchat or whatever the social medias are these days. But what you don't show is that 30 seconds before you were at each other's throats. You better smile, like my mom grabbing my face and making me smile, right? Like, we don't show that. We show the false presentation. Even though that, you know, I'm not picking on you if that's what your family did this summer. I'm sure it's a beautiful picture. I'll like it later on social media. But we put forward our highlight reels. We conceal the behind the scenes. These are all smoke screens. This is called deception. It's smoke and mirrors, and this runs against the very ethics of the kingdom of God. See, the reality is that it's a lot easier for us to control others than it is for us to allow them to really know us. And as followers of Jesus, or as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we are meant to be truthful people. And a truthful person is someone who is as they seem to be. Uh, To be a truthful person means that we must be what we seem to be. Uh, I'll pick on myself since I picked on everyone else in the room today. Uh, That means that I am who I am in front of you at home with my family. That we are who we seem to be. So then what does it take to be a truthful person? Uh, What does it take to become a person uh, who can present themselves as they really are? Or another way of asking that, as in the language of Jesus here, how do I become a person whose yes means yes and whose no means no? I don't know how it will exactly work out for you, but I think for all of us, it will require us to be honest. It will require some humility because it's gonna take us admitting our fears and coming to terms with our insecurities. And one way we do that, and I'll just go ahead and give this plug here, is to, you know, finally schedule that appointment with a therapist or a counselor and to enter into a conversation with someone who is trustworthy and safe, someone you can come to and be honest with about who you are and what you're dealing with, what you're afraid of, what you're insecure about. We must come to terms with who we are, who we really are, which will always involve admitting what we are afraid of. Because see, this is where the relational paradox again reminds us of how desperately we want to know others, how how desperately we want to be known by others, while at the same time, it shows us that we are doing everything we can to hide who we really are. So the question again is, how do we get past this? How do we break through the relational paradox? How do we stop living in paradox, get beyond the fear of letting people really know us? Well, it's one word. You might know it. It's love. It's love. 
Later in our Bibles, we'll come into contact with a man named John who wrote a series of three letters uh, that we bunch all together. And in the first one, he starts talking about how God is love, but he goes a little bit farther and he says, God actually shows us what this love is like. He sends his son Jesus into the world so that we might live through him. This is what love is. He says, it's not that we loved God, but it's that God loved us and sent Jesus as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. But then this is where Jesus brings, or John brings it all home. He says, there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. My friends, we need to understand that the truth of the matter is that Jesus was and is God's living and breathing love among us that went out into the world and found us in our hiding and offered to us his very life as a free gift. I've heard that it was said that when we hide, we basically become the living dead, that we're living but not really. And the good news found in Jesus is that we might live through him that we might receive his real life and his real death that covers all of the mess and the hell that we make in this world through his love. It is love. There is no fear in love. This love embodied in the person of Jesus Christ diminishes and does away with and casts out all fear which opens the way to a life without hiding. So today we're gonna come to the table And I'm gonna move this table first. And as we come to this table today, I'm gonna get this in your way, sorry, Margaret, you can take your place. As we come to this table today, and we receive from this bread and this cup, may we be reminded of Jesus' commitment to us, his commitment to us through his life and death and resurrection. Um, The kneelers, by the way, are set up so that you can pause after receiving. And you can pray or sit in silence. Someone, I mean, I can pray with you. A family member, a friend can do that. But take your time. Sometimes this becomes an assembly line that we go through way too quickly. But I want to encourage you to take your time and let this receiving be a moment for you. Let it be a prayer for you that Jesus would, in fact, Make his love known to you in such a real way today that you might be transformed from a person of fear stuck in hiding into a person who is alive in the very kingdom of God. May that be so.